songs, man. I appreciate John how honest he is, and uh, he's my kind of guy. There you go. I, uh, I like it when uh, people are full of <laughs> I'd rather somebody be honest to say, man, it's hard for me to be here today. Uh, so uh, I'll just jump right in. I got some notes I want to keep here on my phone here. I just, some definitions of some stuff. So I went to a thing not too long ago, and this is just kind of fun. I don't want to poke too much fun. I know it's all good. But uh, I went to this NRA banquet. Uh, I mean, I have some guns, but I, I mean... And I like shooting guns. I know it's a political thing today. Uh, I'm not, like, big into guns. I don't have one in my car. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, it's not about guns. My father-in-law is a big NRA supporter. He bought a whole table. And this is one of these things where they, like, let you drink a bunch, and then they start trying to get you to buy stuff, and it's just to raise a bunch of money, and you get all these door prizes. And uh, I really didn't want to go, uh, but I went because... It, uh, my father-in-law had bought the tickets. And there was a chance you could win like a bazooka or something. And uh, I'm not kidding. It was like a pistol block bazooka thing, and it came apart. And I was like, wow. Everybody was into it. But anyway, so this, the, 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 the Lee County senator, whoever it was, came, and they had him give the, the little prayer and everything before. And uh, it's hard, you know. I mean, people pray as people pray. Praying. And I'm not here to judge anybody praying or anything, and I'm not really saying, I'm just saying that he had to give a speech, and he said, look, everybody's asking me what I'm doing politicking here at the NRA, and I'm not politicking here at the NRA. I'm just here to support the NRA. This is what this guy's saying. He's like, but you ought to be glad that there is a politician here because I'm the only politician that's here. None of your other elected officials are here supporting the NRA and our God-given right to guns and on and on and on. And so he gave like a 10 minute political speech. Of course, he's saying he's not political and not politically motivated by being there. And then he gets ready to give the prayer, which is for dinner. And like we were just saying, Dick, I mean, hey, what's wrong with, hey, God, bless the food, amen, nothing. What's wrong with God, help, amen, nothing. An honest prayer, there's nothing wrong with. But a dishonest prayer, you know. And I see this guy, let's bow our heads to pray. And he brings his phone up here and he starts to pray this prayer. And so I know he's reading the prayer. And the, reading a public prayer is really smart because you that means you write it. And if you write the public prayer, you can say what ought to be said for the group, uh, right? But it was obvious that he had just bulleted, bullet pointed this prayer with like the most Christian-ish things that he could possibly say. Like, he was like, thank you, dear Jesus, Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world for being here tonight. You know what I mean? It's like, and I mean, I was just going, like, this guy, it's like, thank you for your, you know, I mean, he was just getting all theological and everything. And and uh, anyway, it was amen, and we went on. And I just remember thinking, man, that, that just didn't sit well. It just wasn't. Play the game. And yeah, and uh somebody that has to pray a bunch of public like I know how it is and I'm really not shooting at him it, it's just uh, but it, there was something in not genuous, uh, genuine about it there was something that was he was calling in and phoning in you know and it was not really authentic and not only and, and man I'm really being hard on this guy but if y'all met this person you would be like this is the most politician like politician polit I mean he is drenched with political everything like you know, Chad, and his like, name was like Chad McMahon or something like that. Chad McMahon, Chad McMahon. And he went around and everybody politicked and everything. But it got me really thinking about how, uh, how close it is between an authentic expression of something and, and an un inauthentic one. Or how, uh, you know, how much, like, what we're doing, it might be, we might do it, and we might say that right, and, and, who knows? But if we don't really mean it, it's it, there's something that's really lacking there, and uh, almost offensive. And I guess where that's where I'm getting with you guys today. If he'd have bowed his head and prayed and just and I don't know, uh, there was this guy one time they asked this is Bill Bright and they asked him if he uh, 
that this guy had gone around and asked a lot of leaders what they, uh, a lot of questions, like a lot of big church leaders and stuff and, and big ministry leaders. And they would, he would always ask them what Jesus meant to you. And people would give lots of different answers. And he, he was writing a book or something. But he asked Bill Bright all these questions. And Bill Bright started Campus Crusade for Christ. And they got down to the last question, what does Jesus mean to, uh, to you? And Bill Bright couldn't answer it. Uh, couldn't get words out. Just started to cry. And he said, I have to enter, I'm really sorry to end, end the interview. And uh, the guy said that it spoke more to him than anything. And he didn't say anything. But he couldn't answer it because, uh, because the weight of it was so powerful. And I don't know. It's like, you know, you can... The new quarters, you flip those new quarters and they feel light and weak. You get old silver dollar and, you know, you're like, man, this thing's substantial. It's real. It's like, and I don't know, but the, for us, it's hard to discern what's real and fake. And we still have the ability to do that, for certainly for ourselves. But God is seeing things in crystal clear black and white. My engineer father-in-law told me that years ago. I never forgot. He says, look, it might be gray down here, but to the man upstairs, it's black and white. It is clear as day. And uh, he sees truth. He sees us. He sees our heart. He sees our, uh, perceives our thoughts from afar. Knows them before we have asked them. Knows the number of hairs on our head. Our, all of our days are ordained and numbered. And so we have an all-knowing God. And so when we think about prayer, when we think about our expressions of faith, even to be asked to pray publicly, uh, to sing these songs like we sing. Do we phone in? Do we mean it or not? And nobody can answer those questions for us, can help us, but we need to be reminded of that stuff. And it reminded me, uh, and I know it's a negative example, but it reminded me, I was like, I don't want to ever be that guy, man. Like, if I'm going to pray for the meal before the meal, I want to sincerely thank God for the meal. And what is praying for the meal for anyway? Isn't it to sort of center yourself and to calm yourself and to, to digest well? Like, it's to give yourself a moment to, to breathe and say, here I am, and I'm alive, and we have food, and it's not promised, and we should be grateful. And so just the prayer before, prayer before food is, you know, like we make it just a thing that we're supposed to do because we have to do it or just so we snatch our chicken leg. But uh, if we want to, if we're going to do it, then let's do it well. And uh, let's take the time. I, I knew this, this man named uh, Julian Fagan. He uh, lived in Amory, and he was a Bible teacher for many years, had a fair, went to law school, and became a lawyer. And, uh, you know, probably not that bad of a career move. But anyway, he, uh, he had had all these books on the wall and stuff, and I really liked him. Uh, but I'll never forget, I uh, was good friends with his son, and we, we were there one uh, night when we went to Mississippi State, and we got ready to bless the food. And he said, let's bless the food. And we bowed our heads. And he prayed a prayer to bless the food. And man, I'm telling you, we had like about a minute worth of church. And it wasn't like he was preaching. He wasn't saying things like, thank you, Lamb of God, that takes away the sins of the world. It wasn't bulletin. But it was just from the heart. It was just from the gut. You know, it was, and you could tell it was not, and it was very obvious that it was. And I remember it making an impression on me that I always ought to pray if I'm going to pray. Right? You always ought to pray if you're going to pray. I read this definition uh, uh, from A.W. Tozer on the worship. Now, you know, in, in the Bible, it's like a lot about, you know, there's a lot of things that are all over the Bible, but then it never defines the terms, like faith. It's kind of hard. you got to kind of look at a lot of it to, to define the terms, or grace. It's a word we use a lot. What's it mean in the Bible? There's a biblical definition of grace. There are probably several, or love, or mercy, or, or sovereignty, or whatever, right? Well, worship is one of those things. It seems very central to us. It seems central to our Christian uh, uh, culture and what we do. But then, like, we just we just say, that well, let's just sing, or, or whatever. And there's not a good definition. But A.W. Tozer caught me. He's a little... Uh, I like A.W. Tozer. He's a little fundamental for me, and he's a little uh, dogmatic. But every once in a while, it's okay, right? So he says, Worship is to feel in the heart and express in some appropriate manner a humbling sense of uh, admiring awe. Worship is to feel in your heart. He felt like to worship, at least on the very baseline level, was to feel it. 
to feel it. Now, we were taught, hey, I don't know what y'all was taught. Why would you ignore your feelings? It's just about faith and not feelings. And we, because feelings are funny and we'll, 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 we'll feel good this week and not. But I don't know about you, but man, and, I, and, and maybe I'm not supposed to, but my, I put a lot of stock in my feelings. Like, I filter everything. And, and I think the older I get, at least I know now. I'm like, oh, oh I don't feel great today. I feel a little this way, so, you know. But uh, I still filter things to my feelings, and I want to feel God. I mean, what is the God? Where is this religion where we don't feel God? I mean, to me, our emotions and our feelings and stuff are all of it. Now, our thinking and our logic and stuff is important, too. But it's not uh, any more important than, than these heartfelt feelings. And, and you call it sentimental, whatever. But there is a need for us to be authentic in worship and to feel stuff. I felt like Tozer was really smart for saying that. Uh, this other guy I read, he said that uh, he's talking about English definition of worship, worth and ship. Okay, and worth is obviously where we get our uh, you know, English word for worth. Uh, uh, and then ship is the shape or the quality of something. So friendship is like the quality of friends or sportsmanship is the quality of you know, if you're a good sport or not. And so, uh, so worship is, is, is worth and the value that we assign to that. And, uh, and so when we worship, we're trying to assign value and we're trying to, uh, be honest about who God is and how we should feel about that. And to me, um, this is where it gets a little tricky, but I think to feel empty feelings and to worship through that is to worship authentically. Because if you feel, if you only worship God, He has a sense of fullness, and you only, you know, you only want to do it when you're authentic and you're feeling it, right? Well, it's only going to be here and there. But lots of times in the Scripture, people felt empty and felt at zero and felt like, like, almost nothing left. And it was out of those feelings that they decided to worship. As well, it's really interesting stuff. If you uh, look at Moses, you know uh, it, it, the burning bush and everything. He realizes God. He gets down, and worships. Uh, when Job, uh, when Job finds out that everything's been taken away, go read it. Hey, all your kids are dead. Hey, all of your uh, uh, riches and everything's gone. It, hurricane. Uh, oh yeah, everybody's dead. Everything's dead. Oh, your health is nothing. Like you're, you're gonna like he got all the bad news in one day, right? You go read back, what does he do? He says he gets on the ground and he worships God. Mm -hmm. Not what you're thinking. I mean, you think he's feeling all great about God that day? God, you're so awesome. Thank you for killing my, all my kids. No, he's saying, I don't get this at all, but like, out of me, I feel like the right thing to do is, is to still give you credit and to still give you glory. And like, he worships. David, uh, King David, when King David, you know, he, he sleeps with Bathsheba, gets in trouble. Man, she gets pregnant. He can't hide. He has her killed. Well, what happens? Well, the baby dies. He fasts and prays and everything. And they say, hey, David, the baby dead. He says he gets down and worships. He gets down and worships God. You're thinking, why would you worship God that way? Because you have to worship God for his ways. And his ways are good even when we're not good. His dealings with us and his ways with us, for us to realize that, to put that stuff in perspective, positive or negative, at least we have an authentic expression. And when we make that authentic expression to God, He can handle it. I think He can handle it a lot better than our freezed out, dried, you know, in the box ready comments that we have for Him to try to get Him to get off our back or to give us what we want. Just like the uh, inauthentic prayer or something like that, I think God just hates hypocrisy. And He looks at it all the time. It's like, a It'd be be hot or cold, right? But don't just be right there. Man. You know, be hot or cold. And I think why? Because God wants us to be authentic in our in our interactions with Him. And if you're negative and upset and mad at Him, go ahead and tell Him. That's an authentic prayer. That's an authentic response, right? An authentic response. And you know, anger means that you care. That's the positive side to to, to feeling anger is that you care about that. You don't get angry about stuff you don't care about. And so to me, when, even when we're angry at God, well, that means we care. 
And all my friends that are atheists and agnostic and everything, and I listen in, and you don't have to listen very hard to hear it well, and it's not that they don't believe, it's that they're just pretty mad about it. Man, I'm thinking they're in a good situation because at least they know that, and the responses that they get moving forward at least can be, something can happen with them. But this fake sort of shell response stuff, nobody knows what to do with that except to not believe it. And, and it pushes people away, and it pushes us away. And to me, the more that we go through motions of stuff that we aren't really into, the more that it invalidates that stuff, the more, that, the, the more it makes that stuff not important. And, 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 it just, and it just doubles over this sentiment that we, don't, that we shouldn't care, that it doesn't make any difference and that nothing matters. Uh, I want to read a little bit more of this A.W. Tozer because I read this article. I thought it was powerful stuff. He says, millions call themselves by his name. It is true and pay token or homage to him in some way. But a simple test will show how little he is really honored among them. Let the average man be put to the proof of the question of who or what is above and his true position will be exposed. Let him be forced into making a choice between God and money, between God and men, between God and personal ambition, between God and self, between God and human love. And God will take second place every time. Those other things will be exalted above. However the man may protest, the proof is in the choice that he makes day after day throughout his entire life. I think Tozer is good for some of that stuff because he was kind of a prophet towards the church and telling, is reminding the church of, of what they ought to be doing and how they ought to be uh, living. And for me, Tozer's words mean that I have to check my motives and check myself, and I need to be asking the question, is my heart really here? And uh, I think that the answer is, for me, it's not. And so the question is, what do we do about a heart that doesn't feel what we want it to feel, and about, a, about our insides that are all jumbled up and confused? What do we do with that? How, how can we be authentic? Uh, Christian people if we're all divided like that inside. And, the question, and I think the answer is to say we can. And most every Christian sermon and every Christian message that you ever heard is telling you that you need to repent. And that we are to live a life of repentance. And that, that we have to be confessing our stuff. And that we're having to be trying to get on that track and keep with it. But what uh, is so important about worship, I think, is that all the rest of the stuff will happen well if that part is lined up. Meaning that if your heart's affection is at least in tune with God. All the rest of it can happen. All the work that God wants you to do. All the choices that you'll need to make. So much of our stuff, it's like we don't want to worship God, give Him any credit, fall in love with Him, which is all those motivating things that we actually need. But then we want to find this sort of dry motivation for doing it. Or we maybe just don't even, we just skip the motivation part, but our mom and dad want us to do it, or it's just the right thing to do, or it's you know, and then we wonder how things have gotten impotent and where and when we've lost God and we don't have him anymore. And he just calls us back to him over and over again, right? Because nothing else needs to be above him. First command, uh, I'm the Lord your God. You should have no other gods before me. And I like to uh, remind you guys because you'll impress your friends, but it, the commands always start not with, I'm the Lord your God. Uh, uh, you should have no other gods before me, but I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. And then the command is, you shall know the gospel for me. And so what does that do? Even in the Old Testament, it still puts stuff in the right order. It's not, you shall have no other gods before me, follow the rest of these commandments, and then I'll love you. It's, I'm the Lord your God who rescued you out of Egypt, or brought you out of slavery, I called you by name. Did it all for you. You didn't do anything. All you did was walk out. I'm the Lord your God who loves you now. Now then. Let's talk about people that lived in slavery for a long time and how do we help these people learn how to not feel like slaves anymore. And the Ten Commandments ends up being this means to liberation. We like to look at it as a means to prison. That God's going to make this, he takes all of our fun out with the rules. But God's saying these people have been in bondage all these years. You need to know what it's like to live as free people. And number one rule of living as a free person is don't have anything above God. And like John was saying earlier, when we don't have those things about God, we don't feel so, so divided. We don't feel so pathetic. We don't feel like hypocrites. And why do we not pay homage to God better? Why do we not worship more freely? Why do we not pray more honest prayers? Because we, don't, we can't give our whole self to Him. 
We feel like there's a part that we've marked off and left out, or there's a room that we've kept closed. And we know God wants to get there. We know God's after, but it's like, well, God, you have it all, but you just can't have that. But he's like, well, this is where we have to stop. You know, this is where we have to stop. And we all have that stuff in our lives. So what I propose today is that you fight through that stuff. Like Job or like David, even if it's bad, you worship anyway. You you work towards feeling those real feelings anyway. To me, the only thing I have to do to be authentic with God is to just spend the time to get that way. Okay, to just spend the time to be that way. In, in other words, even driving down the day. Well, we listen to the radio. There's all kinds of sermons. I Man, I like to listen to these guys from Boonville and Pratt's in the middle and all these Church of Christ guys. And they always got these old-timer gospel preachers got something to say. I'm telling you, it's good. Or you listen to Robert Jeffers out in Dallas, and he's good. Or you listen to Joel. Or you listen to man, you listen to all the sermons in the world. And I can listen to everything they're saying and get it right back to you here. But the best thing for me to do is to be quiet, really quiet and to focus. And I start with the, the deepest things that I can think of in me. And I speak those things out. And I start to talk about them. I just work my way out. And, and to me, it's kind of like starting in the back of the room and you just start cleaning it out. You know, you start cleaning it out a little bit at a time, putting things in order. And to me, when we're in prayer, what's happening? We're putting things in order with God and God is working with us. And somehow, when we've stayed, when we pray and stay there, not just a quick, but when we stay in it, then when we say amen, we're in a different position than we were. And I guarantee you, authentic, authentic prayer, authentic worship, uh, authentic connection with God is made. And friends, you just don't need church. You don't need music. You don't have to even have this book to do that. It's just you have to have the desire. You know, God says the opposed to proud gives grace to the humble. Grace is the desire and the ability to do his will. So even the desire and the ability, even your desire to do what God's wanting you to do today, if it's in you, God put that in you. Congratulations. It's a gift. It's grace. So you have the desire? Boy, that's huge. Because uh, a, uh, a, a person that's not been a regenerated, ungenerated man, a person that's never met God, doesn't have that desire to please God. He doesn't have a desire to please anybody except himself. So you have any inkling desire to please God. That's, God put that in there. It's grace. All right, that's a reason. That's because he's going to make you hungry to do his will. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They'll be filled, right? The desire to do it is there. It's put there by God. But the ability to carry it out. Who gives us that? God. He, uh, what's he say? He walks, uh, we, he leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I love that. God, this 23rd Psalm, he leads us in the paths of righteousness for our name's sake, for his name's sake. It's all about him. So our worship, our prayers, all this stuff is about him, and it's, it comes from him, and it goes back to him. The only thing that we ought to be in it, friends, even if we're wrong, is we need to be honest. Even if we're wrong, which to be honest and to leave it all out there. And I think God loves people, all right, that 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 are willing to put it out there, to put their feelings out there, and, and to, if they're upset, they're upset. If they're if they're good, they're good. If bad things happen. They still know that the God is the source of all life, and they're going to get down on their knees and they're going to worship Him. They don't like the, we don't like the results, we don't like the outcomes. Well, God's still God. God's still in charge, and that's the disposition I think that He wants us to have. I'm just going to read you one scripture to finish here. This is an important scripture. You know it. You've heard it a lot of times. But listen to what Paul's trying to say here. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. You're not earning that mercy. That mercy is already plain. He's already bought you. He already called you by name. Already saved you in view of God's mercy for you to make the decision to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Why? Because this is your true and proper worship. We're not putting John out of a job to sing. Singing helps us get there. Music takes us to places we can't go. I love music, okay? Music that's written towards God is beautiful to me. I, you know, uh, it helps us get there. It helps us get there. Just like a quiet room can help me get there, okay? 
just like 5 a.m. And, and I'm in that zone. The environment and stuff matters. What you feel, I don't think you can worship the Lord listening to, you know, Slipknot all day. Like, or, you know, I don't know. But apparently even the death metal bands, the best ones, are apparently Christian. I didn't know that. I can't understand the words, but like my friends tell me like the best metal bands are all Christians. Anyway, uh, so you can listen to all that screaming and be like, but they're giving praise to God. You know, it's pretty cool. Uh, but this is your true and proper worship. To live a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And so that just means, friends, simply that if we put God above, God's first, everything else will work. If we put God first, then when we close our eyes and, and spend time, then the motivation and the realness will be there. It'll be there. It'll be there. When we hear a worship song, it'll point us, our minds and our hearts towards thinking about God. If we know every word of it, great. If we don't know any word of it, fine. If you go out and see a sunset, you can find God in that sunset. Because God is first, and God is top. And so everything becomes about him, which is what? To add worth, to give worth. And so we ought to really think, in today's world, in today's culture, in today's church and everything, what's our worship look like? How's our worship? Do we really want to honor God as first in our lives? That is the whole thing. All the rest, I think, is secondary. And all the rest of that stuff will come when this first part is fixed uh, right. Uh, again, uh, we don't. Ha I don't have any great exercises. Uh, we're not going to sing a bunch of songs here now because worship is not just music, and, and right, it is a choice. It's a life that is uh, that's fueled by our love for God. So, uh, so how do you love something? How do you love somebody? You spend time. Uh, you know, you you want them. You spend time with them. You try. You know, you try. I think most of God is happy with our, us trying. I know I've shown y'all, told y'all the story of trying to find a place to spend time with him one morning at a hotel. I couldn't find anywhere. And finally, I just got in this little hot, steamy stairwell because it's the only thing that had any light and privacy in this hotel. And uh, I never even opened my Bible because I didn't get to because I felt the uh, Spirit of God so strongly. And I felt like what he was saying was, I'm just proud that you want to do it. You don't even need to open this Bible. You don't. You don't even, I'm not, I don't want to teach you anything today. I just want us to be together. That's what I felt that time. And when you feel that time uh, at times too, I know you do. And uh, that's the times that we live for God. That's the times that we want. But it can't always be that way, right? It doesn't mean the rest of it's unbalanced. So anyway, I know I'm, I'm kind of shotgunning around. But uh, but think about your worship. We don't, we, we, that, that's gotten put into such a category. And it's, and and yet it might be one of the most important things. And, and we might need to be thinking of it not as music and stuff, but just as our life with God every day is worship and to get to make it about Him and not about us. And uh, it seems like when we do that stuff, maybe the rest of the stuff starts to work. All right, uh, let me pray. And uh, we'll, we'll be finished for today. God, we, we, we don't understand a lot, God. We Even when you said if anybody thinks... That they know they know nothing as, that, as yet they ought to know. That knowledge makes arrogant, but that love edifies. And so, Father, we don't want to know more. Probably don't even want to feel more, God. We just want to, to love more. And, and love can't be forced, even though it's a command that we're to love you with all of our heart. Uh, it's a choice. And, and we choose it with our time and, and uh, with our thoughts with our actions, and with our everyday life. So I ask that you would help us to reframe what worship is, what prayer is. And God, I ask that you would uh, put it in us to be honest. Because it seems like if, if we're to be childlike, if there's anything that children are, they're very honest and, and, and very clear about, about where they are, where they stand, and what they need. And so we want to be your children. And so I ask that, God, for each of us, this week, that you would meet us uh, where we are, and uh, that you would meet us in our honest pursuit of you, and that you would give us ways to love you, and give us opportunities to serve you, and God, as we step forward, we walk in those ways when you lead us, God, that you would just bring us to new heights of faith, and uh, God, that's my prayer today, in Jesus' name, amen.